Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Um, it is my honor to introduce the Honorable Louise Arbor, who I think can be summarized in one world as a premier international public service servant because she has held a number of highly important and very influential positions within the world system the global system of the UN and other institutions. So let me start by telling you a little bit about Louise's background. She's a Canadian lawyer, a prosecutor, and a jurist. She was the special representative from the Secretary General of the United Nations for migration. And other positions she has held in Q include being UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, she's a former Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada and the Court of Appeals of Ontario, She's a former chief prosecutor of the International Cr Criminal Tribunals of the former Soviet, um, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And she made history with this indictment of the first sitting head of state by the Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic. Louise has received more than 50, maybe even 60, I couldn't count them all, distinguished honors, including awards such as honorary degrees from many notable universities, honorary membership in distinguished societies around the globe, and other awards, too many to name, but they include such things as the Roosevelt Four Freedoms Award. Her role as Special um, Secretary General, Special Representative for Migration is something that I think we will focus on today because it is an issue that I know many of the people that I'm involved with at SICE and around Washington are very interested in this issue, and but that we, Louise will touch on other topics in her discussion with us today. But for those who don't know, I did want to summarize just a little bit of the details for the Global Compact on Migration. It was the first ever UN agreement on a common approach to international migration in all its dimensions. It is grounded in the values of state sovereignty, responsibility sharing, non-discrimination, and human rights. It recognizes that a cooperative approach to, is needed to optimize the overall benefits of migration while addressing the risks and challenges for individuals and communities in countries of origin, transit, and destination. The compact aims to mitigate the adverse drivers and structural factors that hinder people from building and maintaining sustainable livelihoods in their countries of origin. It intends to reduce the risks and vulnerabilities that migrants face, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling their human rights and providing them with care and assistance. It seeks to address the legitimate concerns of the states and communities while recognizing that societies are undergoing demographic economic, social, and environmental changes at different scales that may have implications and results for migration. It strives to create conducive conditions that enable all migrants to enrich our societies through their human, economic, and social capacities, and thus facilitate their contributions to sustainable development at the local, national, regional, and global levels. So with that introduction to the subject matter that we might touch on today, I'm going to ask Louise to join me at the podium. And she, I think, will cover a wide range of topics which reflect her wide-ranging experiences. And I think you will all, I know you will all be enlightened and inspired by what she has to say and what she has done with her life. So we will look forward, after a little conversation between Louise and myself, we'll look forward to questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maureen. I, um, I just found out I'm totally color coordinated, which I'm very happy with. But just in case you read a lot into these things, I just want to say that in Canada, the political colors are the opposite, as they are in the US. So the liberals are red, the conservatives are blue. And we have several political parties, including the Greens and the NDP, which is the New Democratic Party, which is orange. Um, my daughter is a little more politically involved than I am, so she would read a lot into wearing a political color. I just want to make sure that this is not the case here. 
Um, I told Maureen, I would like to talk to you a little bit about my, essentially my three stints in the UN system, because in a sense, they represent three different eras, three different sets of issues. And I think it's helpful to take a little bit of distance uh, when we look at the issues that we're confronting today. Um, sometimes I have to pinch myself, um, and certainly my children are stunned when I remind them that I actually served in the UN under four secretary generals. I was appointed as the chief prosecutor of the tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. My candidacy was presented to the Security Council by Boutros Boutros Ghali. But when I took office, he had already left, so I worked most of my time in the UN with Kofi Annan. And then towards the end of my tenure, the last year and a half of my tenure as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ban Ki-moon had become the Secretary General. And then two years ago, Antonio Guterres called me and asked me if I would be his representative on international migration. So it's also, it's a broad um, time frame, which I think you could relate in your own minds to the political climate in this country and elsewhere in these different periods. It's not, it bears obviously very significantly, I think, on some of the issues uh, that arose in that time. I should also say that my, it, I really have been an accidental tourist uh, in the international scene. I'm a, I'm a trained lawyer. I was an, a, an academic. I was a law teacher in Canada. Then I went on the bench. And it's by absolute pure, I think, serendipity that I uh, became the prosecutor of war crimes. So when I was appointed to do that work, my background is basically in domestic criminal law. I knew nothing of international humanitarian law, the laws of war, the rules of engagement, armies, none of that. And I had never set foot at UN headquarters. Um, and I don't think anybody, frankly, in the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa had ever heard of me. That's for another story. But it's, it also, I think from the outset, I came to all this with a puzzled eye maybe a critical one at times, but it also, I think, situates some of the observations that I've made um, along the way. So let me go back to so my first uh, adventure in the UN, which was the International Criminal Tribunals. What I want to stress about that, for those of you who may have followed these developments, in today's political climate, it is unimaginable that the Security Council of the United Nations would come together on a consensual basis, right, with the P5 all aligned, to imagine and put in place such an audacious tool as criminal, personal criminal accountability of heads of states, political and military leaders. In fact, if they hadn't done it then, you would think today that it could not have been done. It's with hindsight, and you have to remember, this was initiated in a theater. The first one was the former Yugoslavia, 1993, where one of the members of the Security Council, uh, the Russian Federation, had a very, very direct interest um, in protecting, in particular, um, Serbia, its ally. And as the case progressed, of course, the involvement not only of a UN peacekeeping mission, but eventually of NATO, meant that this was not some place that nobody could put on a map. This was the big international issue of the time. In retrospect, I think historians will probably have a lot to say about trying to figure out how this came about. Uh, the reality was that I think the Security Council was despairing with its usual toolbox of sanctions and what else could you, they have recourse to, military intervention. There was already a peacekeeping force deployed, um, particularly in, in, uh, in Bosnia and in Sarajevo. The war was still raging. There was no end in sight. And the press, in particular, and some NGOs, were revealing the, the atrocities that were, where the images were actually very evocative of what we had seen at the end of the Second World War. So all that being brought together after 40 years of people trying to resuscitate the Nuremberg and Tokyo model trials of accountability, all of a sudden, the Security Council, this quintessential political body, uh, did what member states couldn't do by treaty or by convention. As I said, 
in my opinion, in today's world, and I could um, testify to that on the basis of the experience I've just had in trying to deal with the, I would have thought, not even as contentious issue, that is human mobility, there's no way you could develop this kind of consensus. So this is quite striking. Where has it left us? Well, it had some structural flaws. The tribunals, well, as you know, first the Security Council created the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and as it was barely getting started, the Rwandan genocide happened, and the Rwandan government at that time asked the Security Council to create a similar tribunal. They were joined through a joint prosecutor and a joint appellate chamber. So this is basically how it all got started. What were, in my opinion, they were some structural fault lines in these institutions which have made it um, very difficult to perpetuate and which I think to some extent have been replicated in the International Criminal Court, which itself I don't think would have ever been imaginable had it not been, I think, for the experience, the positive experience of these two tribunals. Uh, there are several fault lines. In the case of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunal, of course, the biggest fault line was their lack of universal reach. Every time I went to the region, particularly in Serbia, the first question I was asked, frankly by everybody, was, why us? Why have you decided to pick on us? What about the killing fields of Cambodia? Where were you then? And it, I have to say, it took me a long time to give an answer that I was satisfied with, which is, and I was very frank about that, I told them, I concede that singling you out um, well, let's start with the fact that others equally guilty are not brought to account doesn't make you less guilty. But singling you out makes it less fair. So the answer is not to let you off the hook, it's to work together to make sure that everybody is, uh, conduct is assessed by the same standard. And that essentially what ultimately the International Criminal Court was aspiring to, a treaty-based um, court, but as you know, the level of ratification has meant that it suffers from exactly the same defect. Its, it, its reach is, and African states have said it loud and clear, um, particularly it was louder and clearer, uh, uh, the voice of those who felt uh, and were actually targeted uh, by the court, but it remains a fundamental flaw. Justice that is, doesn't have universal reach uh, will always have this flaw. It has, um, and the International Criminal Court itself has also structural problem. I find it very difficult to have under the same institution, essentially the chambers, the judges, the prosecutor's office, and the registry, which are all united, but essentially competing for resources and so on. So it has a lot of institutional uh, shortcomings. Uh, and, uh, and I know we know how uh, history has unfolded in the efforts of the court. There are other issues that may be of less interest to you, but are, I think, discussed in areas in which I work, which is early on in the tribunals, the dominance of the common law system alienated a lot of uh, people who came from different jurisdictions. So when the ICC, the International Criminal Court was created, there was a push to inject some of the more civil law, continental law uh, features. As a result, at times it's a very awkward sort of mixture of system. It was never created as a truly indigenous international institution. And to give you one example of what that creates as, as a, a kind of intellectual or political difficulty, in our own national systems, uh, we always assume, obviously, that the prosecutor carries the might of the state, and therefore, rightly so, we need to give a lot of protections to the accused, the right of, to, to be represented, to, the right to an attorney, uh, the right, the presumption of innocence, in, in a sense, because it's such an imbalance when a person stands alone facing the might of the state. In these tribunals, I, having been the prosecutor, I could vouch for that, half the time the state is on the other side. The state is on the defense side. So I cannot tell you how many hours I spent with my colleagues, many of whom were US attorneys, prosecutors, and we would say to ourselves, 
How can it be so hard to prove what everybody knows? Well, it's because the system had, had rules that were based on a set of assumptions that were actually in reverse in that kind of environment. Anyway, this is getting us into a lot of legal issues that I don't want to get into too much detail with. The, what I wanted to stress about that era, though, was the, the audacity, essentially, of the Security Council, a Security Council that today seems so lame, paralyzed, uh, inefficient, when, in fact, it is the guardian of international peace and security, and um, at that time was prepared to go completely outside its, its kind of zone of comfort. Um, I should add as a footnote that, of course, none of the members of the Security Council, certainly none of the permanent members, felt directly, directly threatened by the reach of the tribunals, the former Yugoslavia, its competence was on the territory of the former Yugoslavia, the same for Rwanda. However, when NATO started bombing Kosovo in 1999, and again, I could vouch for that because I've seen the shock and awe on their face when I met with several foreign ministers of NATO countries, and I congratulated them for the act of faith they had placed in me in submitting themselves to my jurisdiction. <laughs> this was very poorly received. Uh, most of them are not lawyers, so at first they said, well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you are bombing, you, are, you have declared war against Serbia, and you're conducting, your theater of operation is Kosovo, which is it, within the territorial <laughs> jurisdiction of my competence. So if you commit war crimes, I'll have to prosecute you. Anyway, it's, that's again for another day, and I won't, you could look up who was the Secretary of State here and how surprised she was <laughs> to find that out. Um, and of course, it, led, it didn't lead to prosecutions. But again, I think had they known that in 1993, I'm not sure they would have been as enthusiastic about or they might have curtailed the jurisdiction of the, the tribunal in some other way. Uh, so after I did these war crimes prosecution and invested a lot of time and energy in learning international humanitarian law and the laws of war. Then I went to the Supreme Court of Canada, where, of course, we don't do any of that. I had to relearn quite a bit of Canadian law. And I went there thinking, uh, in Canada, we, don't, we have mandatory retirement at 75, which, when you're 50, you think it's a lifetime. So I thought I was there for the rest of my life. But uh, Kofi Annan called me and asked me if I would quit the Supreme Court of Canada and become the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which it's not done very much usually. But again, having had it, first of all, working with I really believe that he would champion uh, human rights issues. This was 2004. Um, it was a time where I thought it was worth putting back a lot of efforts into the UN system. Let me try to characterize that era. So this is 2004 to 2008. In 2006, what had been called the Commission on Human Rights was reformed into the Human Rights Council. The significance of that, I think, is that this was a consolation prize for the failure to reform the Security Council. It's, it's, there's nothing else than that, and the reform was largely cosmetic. It, it was not a revolutionary transformation, but it was an opportunity to debate, um, you know, what kind of institution we want, what should the membership be. Some were arguing that it should be, I think at that time, the, uh, the commission might have been 53 members and it got reduced to 47, something like that, but in that range. Some, particularly in the U.S., were advocating that it should be very small, like the Security Council, what I described as the self-appointed club of the virtuous, and that all the bad guys should be out and just us, the good guys, should be in, which I thought was totally contrary to the spirit of universality of rights, that everybody has to be under the tent. That era was, I would have said, the era of norms. The international human rights system was addicted to norm development rather than enforcement and implementation of fundamental rights. A lot, decades were spent negotiating 
the Convention uh, on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the Convention, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, enormous amount of diplomatic effort and so on to negotiate commas in documents that in the end, if you looked at documents like the Convention Against Torture, needed implementation, not refinement. It's at that time, so th there was this kind of machinery that, in my view, was very addicted to norm development, while, again, we saw the beginning of uh, some frontal attacks on established norms, such as in this country, for instance, uh, open questioning about the applicability of the torture convention uh, in all cases. You know, the ticking bomb, there were all these examples being put forward. So we saw a kind of a, an effort on, on one side to refine and develop new norms, and at the same time, m more, I think, than, than ever before, very overt, blatant, bold, actually, confrontation of existing norms. Not to suggest that these norms were applied and that no states were involved in uh, exercising different forms of torture and other forms of cruel punishment and treatment, but to actually question the the merit of, of an absolute prohibition against torture, that was, I think, the, a more overt expression of some of the fracture that kept creeping into the universal uh, human rights system. The Human Rights Council, as I said, um, in my view, became the kind of, the forum of the disenfranchised. The, the select club in the UN, there's no question, is the Security Council. And a lot of the same issues are dealt with in the Human Rights Council, but at the end of the day, it doesn't have a lot of power. And because, you know, when there are not a lot of consequences to your words, you could say pretty outrageous things. So it became, I think, a forum where lots of things could be said without too much consequences, but as we know, I think, in the current political envi environment, words ultimately do carry consequences, division, things that are better left unsaid when they start being, it's, it's okay to say it in the public domain, all of a sudden it acquires some kind of legitimacy. So, so I think even after it was transformed, the Human Rights Council be, continued to be an intensely um, uh, political, political body. One initiative that was taken, and I have to say I haven't followed it uh, closely enough to see whether, in fact, it delivered anything, is what, was, what is called the Universal Periodic Review. Because it didn't have universal membership, we thought at least every state of the UN, starting with the members of the council themselves, should be subjected periodically, I think it's three or four years, to a public scrutiny of their human rights performance where NGOs, civil society, have an opportunity to speak. This was quite imaginative because up to then, the council was always um, criticized, or was criticized by many, again, as being very selective. It was always focusing on the same countries. Uh, Israel, of course, was, a, was, a, was on permanent attack, but so was Cuba. So this idea was then the spotlight is going to be put on everybody, not that they not that you can usefully compare the human rights record, say, of Norway and, uh, I don't know, Zambia. It's irrelevant, I think, to compare countries. What you need to do, and that was the spirit of it, is every three or four years look at whether any country is regressing, progressing, or stagnating on, it, on the different human rights issue that it confronts. So this has been put in place. I'm not sure to what extent it has um, delivered. It also, when I said norms were starting to be, to be under attack, even within, well, first of all, the international human rights system is based on the affirmation that uh, human rights represented in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are universal and represent universal values. This became more and more questioned. Um, and I think, <laughs> and this gave us a taste of what was to come, but maybe the culmination of this, what, what some call this clash of civil, civilization on human rights issues, was on freedom of expression. You'll remember the caricature of the prophet uh, in Denmark, which led to 
all kinds of, of uh, uh, violence. And so the clash, which I'm not sure that Roosevelt would have foreseen when he spoke of the four freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of expression, and freedom of religion. Well, these two had never been, I think, had never clashed as overtly as they started doing during that period of time. And I think we have seen a continuation of these. It's very interesting also to, to see how even in Western countries that are otherwise very similar on this particular one issue, freedom of expression, for instance, Canadian law is very different from US law and this kind of absolutist um, position that is taken in the US is very foreign to other mature democracies such as ours. So you can imagine what it looks like to those who de don't even recognize that as a fundamental value worthy of, of this kind of constitutional type protection. Um, and then the other thing that is of interest to me is it's at that time that we saw the emergence of this concept of lawfare. Uh, which was denounced by some. It's, us it's very often used in a negative way. I think most of the time it's used in a negative way. In a sense, to suggest that we're seeing the legalization of politics or that the law is being hijacked to advance political interests, particularly in conflict situations. So again, for people like me who are very committed to the rule of law as the most important organizing principle, of our uh, democratic societies, this was very um, disturbing, I think it's fair to say. And along with the Universal Periodic Review, what I understand by talking to some of my colleagues that are there, we have seen also a kind of contamination of civil society by a growth of what are sometimes called gongos, that is NGOs that are really government fronts that, are, that do the bidding of government, so a, a kind of contamination of what otherwise was a voice that had considerable importance in the protection of human rights in a body that is a body made out of duty bearers. Now you have to think of that. The human rights system consists, states are duty bearers and citizens are right holders. And the body that is supposed to manage all that is exclusively made out of duty bearers. So it's not surprising it's not always performing brilliantly. Okay, so let me then jump. So I finished that, human rights. And then in 2017, 18, I went back to the UN to do this work on the Global Compact for Migration. Uh, this was very, a very different UN I was coming back into. Um, I don't think in the previous two occasions, nobody had, was saying inside the system that multilateralism itself was under threat. But when we started working on migration, uh, that was becoming an increased uh, concern inside the organization. I don't think we could create the UN today if it didn't exist. I don't think we see an agreement by all the current member states on the content of the UN Charter, on the Universal Declaration, on all this the body of law that has created these institutions. We might be able to create some of its more operational agencies, you know, the World Health Organization, although the World Trade, um, World Trade, the, yes, the, the WTO, um, it's, as you know, its dispute resolution system is under uh, question, but for the most part, I think the, the more operational arms of the UN, the agencies, funds, programs, we'd probably come to some kind of, of arrangement, but the more, kind of political, deliberative bodies, I think we'd, uh, we'd see that very difficult to put in place. And yet, we are at a time where whatever we pick as the defining issues of our generations, all of them call for a robust uh, multilateral engagement, whether it's climate change, which is totally self-evident. I mean, the notion of territorial-based interest is decreasing in importance in climate change, in communications technology, which we know um, are not particularly interested in the kind of the 19th century vision of the world organized by geography, um, and migration, human mobility, which is currently uh, defined by the right, the privilege, in fact, the responsibility of states to determine 
who enters their territory, on what terms and conditions, and yet we live in an environment where um, both forced displacement is likely to be on the increase. Uh, we haven't resolved the kinds of countries that push people to be displaced internally and eventually uh, to have to crash the borders of their countries. And I think both communications and transportation uh, facilities uh, make it inevitable that we will see more, not less, uh, human mobility in the decades to come. And, it, and we could talk about the various examples of that, but there, no country can successfully develop and apply its own immigration policy without the cooperation of its, and I, I'll say neighbors, meaning not just its immediate geographic neighbors. It's an environment that is critically uh, dependent on international cooperation. And because of, I think, this erosion of, of recourse to multilateralism, the negotiation of this global compact was very painful, I think it's fair to say. The United States is the only country that did not participate at all. Uh, the original, the launch of the set of, uh, there were negotiations, thematic negotiations, and consultation, I should say, and geographic ones. And at the outset of this, the launch of this process, the United States announced that it would not participate, and it did not. So for about a year, um, there was nobody there. And then as it got closer to the adoption of the document, which was done by consensus in Marrakesh, and then went back to the General Assembly, then in the General Assembly, uh, the US was there, and a movement in a 10 days between the, the finalizing the agreement on the text in Marrakesh and uh, the, the formal adoption by the General Assembly. Uh, five countries, 152 voted in favor, five voted against, and 12 abstained. It's very disappointing because this, this is, it's a document that has been so grossly misrepresented, particularly on social media, you have to pinch yourself to wonder what document they read. It's very comprehensive. It's a political document. It's basically an indication of an intention to better cooperate. That's, and uh, many were disappointed that it wasn't launched uh, to become a legally binding document, another convention. This was such a non-starter. First of all, it would have taken more than a decade to agree on anything uh, resembling that kind of document. And again, the absence of ratification. There is already a convention called the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. Not a single Western country has ratified it. And it was decades in the negotiations in May. So I became persuaded that if we could get a good a lot of goodwill and a good political consensus on a document that has very good working parts that are, in my opinion, undeniably in the, the general public interest, we would get more accomplished. And I still believe that that's the case. It deals with all aspects of migration. Um, contrary to what was said in many parts of the world, it doesn't promote migration. It doesn't tell anybody that you have to have a particular migration policy, but it makes very clear um, that international cooperation will go some distance. The, the biggest impediments, I or the, the biggest uh, hurdles, were the topics of irregular migration, which is the way it's called in enlightened circles, sometimes it's called illegal, illegal migrants, uh, the terminology in that area, as in many others, is, is loaded with prejudice and mischaracterizations and so on. It's also really interesting to look at how it started. The UN had never, ever before. It was almost a taboo subject. Human mobility was not a, a, to be an open conversation in the UN system. State sovereignty was always asserted as a barrier, and yet it's the Europeans that ask for it. After the 2016 and I'll really say so-called migration crisis. And I say so-called because, I mean, to put it in caricature terms, when a million people knock on the door of 500 million, it shouldn't be a crisis. But it was, it was a crisis of confidence. A lot of people in Europe uh, felt that their governments had lost control of their borders. It was very clear that the instruments we had in place, like the Refugee Convention, uh, were no longer 
robust enough in their conception and application to deal adequately um, with this issue. So it's the Europeans that came to the UN, and not surprisingly, their issue, everybody has an issue, everybody has an agenda. The only thing they wanted to talk about was return. Ensuring, again, the terminology, you know it well, country of origin, country of transit, country of destination. Nowadays, many countries are, you'd be hard pressed to characterize as more one than the other whether it's uh, Turkey or Morocco or Mexico, they're at once countries of origin, transit, destination. But the idea was that countries of origin had to recognize their obligation to cooperate in the return of people who were elsewhere in an irregular situation. Honestly, in the grand scheme of the issues that we had on the table to discuss worldwide on migration, <laughs> this was really not a big deal. Really not, but it became the central pole. So irregular migration, return, and of course, the fundamental human rights of people who are in an irregular situation. So what are the human rights um, entitlements to people who may not have, whose um, presence in a country is not regular? And it's really important to maintain that distinction because when we talk about illegal migrants, it evokes border crashing when in fact over, the overwhelming majority of people who are in a country in an irregular fashion enter the country with a visa. This is no border crashing and hordes and swarms and whatever terms are used to describe that. And it was very difficult to get the kind of traction that I believe we had to talk about, or first of all, to explain the difference between refugees and so, I say so-called economic migrants because that term has also become very pejorative. Right? Economic migrants are people who have a choice. They should have stayed home. Their reality is that the, the, whether their displacement is voluntary in any meaningful sense of the word uh, is very debatable. People who can't have their children educated in their countries, can't make a living, and yet they don't fall within the ambit of the refugee convention. The proper solution, had we been maybe back in the 90s, would have been to negotiate an expansion of the Refugee Convention, a protocol to address other forms of forced displacement. This was absolutely, clearly a non-starter. So we were left with the reality that there's in the world today some 25 million refugees whose plight is not addressed adequately under the legal regime to which they're entitled. And we have some 450 million migrants um, people who, for a variety of sometimes very personal reason, uh, in fact, it's interesting that the UN definition of a migrant doesn't capture the ones that are currently in transit. It's defined because otherwise you'd catch all the tourists. So it's defined as people who have lived for at least a year in a country other than their country of uh, origin or nationality. Because if you try to capture population movements, you'd have difficulty, so anyway, that's the, and that's 450 million of them. The overwhelming majority, of course, being in a perfectly regular legal situation. Um, so the compact was very, in a sense, not poisoned, but hijacked by some of these issues, when other issues that are really important, for those of you who are interested, particularly in international development, you'll know about remittances. Just before coming, actually, because I hadn't looked at that in a few months, I looked at the, the World Bank uh, numbers for this year. Remittances, which are the monies that migrants send back to their home countries, uh, have historically represented consistently three times more than the official development aid that rich countries sent to the developing world. And it's on the increase. Last year it grew again to its now uh, going to developing countries, $529 billion, and the, the totality is $689 billion, but that's, you know, can Canadians working in the UN sending money to Canada. But people working in the UN sending money back to put their cousins to school in El Salvador and in uh, Colombia and in somewhere in Africa, five, over $500 billion. It's more than what taxpayers spend 
in uh, developing countries to send home. There are lots of issues associated with that, such as the unconscionably high cost of transfer of this huge amount of money. That's there in the Global Compact. We need a lot of energy, though, to have these issues addressed and stop focusing on these much more marginal but kind of politically energizing um, issues. And, and I'll maybe end with this, this question of remittances also, you have to understand that for a lot of countries, poor middle income countries, in some of them it represents up to 20% of their GDP. So if all of a sudden you close that tap, uh, and the World Bank's estimate is that in many countries it will actually become the greatest source of state income, its remittances. So there's a whole system, economic system of development that is based and should be nourished by well-managed human mobility, uh, as we'll see that increase in the years to come. And the UN is at a time where, when it's needed the most on these kinds of issues, um, I think it's at maybe its more stressed point. Maybe I'll chat with you. Well, um, thank you, Louise. You covered a very broad ter terrain of issues and organizations, which is a clear reflection, reflection of the um, scope and complexity of the issues you've had to deal with in your um, storied career. Um, so let me start with um, a couple of questions about the International Criminal Court. You were there in its early days. And now we're at a point where, as you said, the legitimacy of the court is being questioned by many countries who feel that they are being singled out as violators of humanitarian law when others who are as bad or worse are neglected. And African countries in particular give voice to this sense that they are being uh, unfairly targeted. Um, how would you respond to that issue? Why is it happening? Is it unfair? How can we redress that? Well, I think the, the, the first and very obvious reason it's happening is that, to their credit, African countries ratified the Rome Treaty in very large numbers. Uh, if you look at the list of countries that have ratified the, the, the Rome Treaty and therefore put themselves under the jurisdiction of the court, you'll see a very large number of African countries, that's the first thing. Secondly, there's still, and in contrast, countries in which um, armed conflict is raging with a lot of visible violations of law don't fall within the jurisdiction of the court, like Syria, for instance. Uh -huh. So for the general public, it looks very unfair, and of course, I think it's fair to say some African leaders who felt the heat or the, their personal exposure to the court have capitalized on this kind of mythology that the court is picking on Africa. Uh, the reality is, again, it's this flaw, this structural flaw, that it doesn't have universal reach. Yeah. So terrible things are happening, and it's being documented in the hope that eventually um, some accountability mechanism could be put in yeah. place. If the Security Council had been in the same mood as it was in the 90s, for instance, on Syria or Libya, or Libya, there's some jurisdiction. On Syria, for instance, the Security Council could have referred yeah. the case to the court, but so that's not happening. So essentially, um, the disproportion of cases coming from Africa is part of this structural... Part of this, among the structural yeah. flaws in the way... And of course, and the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the court is not the primary jurisdiction, but there's not a lot of capacity in a lot of African countries to take on these cases themselves, as opposed to, you know, if there was ever a case um, that was taken, say, alleging uh, some kind of crime, say, by a U.S. citizen, the U.S. courts would have primacy. But in the case of Africa, the ICC becomes the default jurisdiction. Uh -huh. So well, what is your general, uh, general sentiment about sort of the viability of the court going forward? Well, I've said... In another, in another context when I was a little more confident than I am today. But I still believe that this kind of movement 
establishing a form of accountability is irreversible. You, you can't dismantle all of it. Uh -huh. um, and it, ha it takes different forms. You know, there were lots of initiatives, for instance, by countries like Spain and Belgium to exercise their domestic jurisdiction under this principle of universal jurisdiction. So whether this will take root, you know, when I started working at the tribunals, international criminal law didn't exist as a as a discipline. Now it's taught in law schools. There's there's a there is a movement now. Whether the ICC as presently structured and conceived will become 10, 20, 30 years down the road, yeah. the forum, or whether it will take another form. But I think the idea uh, of, of personal criminal accountability is there to stay. It's in, that idea is entrenched and widely recognized, if not always implemented. Voila. And because it's, it has these sort of foundational roots, we may be in a period of uncertainty or wavering on these issues, but you feel the entrenchment will see revive itself or see progress in the future? Well, with maybe one caveat, which is that I think what inspired this movement was very much the Nuremberg trials yeah. and a sense that our never again pledged had been very hollow. But as now the last, the very last survivors of the Holocaust disappear, and you, you know, I was talking to my children's friends the other day who reminded me that they don't know much about the Vietnam War. You know, they weren't there. Yeah. What do you mean you weren't there? You're 40 years old. Well, so what I, I am concerned that, you know, we are a generation that I think had values anchored. And I think we felt rightly so that we had let down our responsibility by not carrying on the legacy of Nuremberg until the 1990s. I like to think that this idea and the value that is there will stay, but, but as this fades yeah. and becomes a distant historical event, that creates a new jeopardy for this idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you had a very, very important point, and I suggest that probably most of the students in this classroom are not ignorant of these things, but the vast majority of young people, even in Germany, I mean, I think the statistics on the number of Germans who really don't even know what the Holocaust was is pretty, even with the intent, you know, structural, government-led intent to teach us in the schools and to educate their students, there still is, is a lack of awareness. And if, if it, that kind of lack of awareness exists in Germany, I can only imagine what it is in the United States. So I think that nurturing another generation of people who are educated in these issues is incumbent upon us, and I hope we can take that up. Um, so I, I wanted to move a little bit to your um, discussion about your, your um, period at the Human Rights um, Commission, because um, again, this is something that many of us, I guess in our generation, thought was a great leap forward. You know, the Universal Declaration of, UN, of, of Human Rights had been established in the 1940s, and respect for it had grown, not always with the degree of knowledge or implementation necessary to really em, em, employ this respect for the convention. But the idea that you raised that some of these rights, particularly freedom of expression, are now even questionable. And we know we're well aware of the assault on freedom of expression around the globe now. A lot of it has to do with expression coming in the crosshair of religious fundamentalism, which is a very unique phenomenon. But do you feel that there are any other rights under the Universal Declaration that are under assault? Yes. Well, in fact, the Shortly after the adoption, as you said, in the late 40s of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was essentially broken down into its two components. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Western countries uh, ratified, adopted, enforced, adored, and pontificated to the rest of the world about civil and political rights and would not touch economic, social, and cultural rights. Whether in good faith or not, the so-called non-aligned, the global south, did exactly the reverse with China at the forefront. 
ratified, endorsed the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and was not so keen on civil and political rights. And in a sense, both sides, and this was the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I mean, this mm -hmm. is exactly, the fracture was very, it was clear in Canada yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, we were the champions of civil and political rights. So the, the general Western posture was that if you have civil and political rights, a mature democracy and a healthy uh, marketplace, the economic and social rights will follow. It, mm -hmm. you know, it will all take care of itself. Uh, it, I think it has demonstrably not that been works, the case. Yeah. And so this fracture uh, meant that for the West that had the means, See, this is when this migration issue arose, it was the first time, at least in the 20 years that I was working in that environment, that Western countries were asked to do something that was hard for them to do. They were used to asking others to do something that was really hard for them to do, like Uganda uh, accepting LGBT rights. Very hard mm -hmm. for them to do. Whether, not that I agree with the fact mm -hmm. that they found it so hard, it's just a reality. Uh, but when the West was asked to ratify the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers, which gave fundamental human rights to irregular migrants, such as the right for their children to be educated and have access to basic medical care and so on, oh, now it wasn't doable. Mm -hmm. And so this led to this an, an aggravation of tensions with developing countries basically saying, all these so-called universal values, they're very transparently a vehicle to promote your economic interest. And you know what, you've done really well at it, but now time's up. Yeah, that, that is the fault line. That is the unbridgeable fault line right now between the West and the less developed countries of the world over these two sets of issues. Yeah. Some recognizing some others, each side is entrenched upon their values which promote their general interest in achieving one set of rights versus the others. Um, so we have a lot to do there. Um, we talked a little bit about um, sort of the ro robust multinationalism that had been behind the development of many of these constructive um, international, um, whether it's conventions or guidelines or commissions or whatever. But multilateralism, as we know, is now again seeing some of its worst days since they were established after World War II. Um, certainly the failure of the United States to lead on multilateral issues. And you know, we saw that was a long time coming. It was manifest clearly during the early um, George W. Bush administration when they retrenched on any effort to include the allies in many of their biggest initiatives, including going to war. But um, there was, you know, a beginning of the fraying of multilateralism, which saw a slight stabilization during the Obama administration, although I do think that the Obama administration itself was not very proactive on the global stage on any of these issues. Um, having said that, I think one of Barack Obama's, President Barack Obama's very public efforts towards the end of his um, second term was the initiative at the UN to have a um, event at the UN which committed countries, which invited countries to commit to setting a set of goals on their own refugee policies. And I do think that was actually one of the more um, enlightened international um, or multi efforts on the part of the Barack Obama administration. Having said that, multilateralism is in, de is in I don't want to say decline, but certainly not robust the way we need it. And I think the U.S. government has played a role in that. But again, do you see any hopes for a turning of the tide on that issue? And what would it take to reignite, you know, would it take a global crisis of some sorts to reignite the commitment to multilateralism and working together on cooperative efforts? Um, I think for, for a very long time, the, the world was willing, I was going to say happy to, but certainly willing to tolerate, this maybe too strong a word, but to contend with the benevolent exceptionalism mm -hmm. 
of the United States. Mm -hmm. Recognizing, and I saw that in, in the field of war crimes prosecutions, that without being paranoid, I think there was a fear by um, leadership in the US that the US had an exceptional exposure yes. as it's called upon yeah. to intervene in many conflicts. And I think this is totally understandable and it, one needs to approach this exceptional position of the US. Um, as long, of course, and when I use the term benevolent, what I mean is, for instance, the US notoriously does not ratify a lot of international instruments, but then it, for the most part, complies sometimes more than those who do ratify. So, and sometimes if, you know, if the Convention on the Rights of the Child creates a problem for the US with respect to, I don't know, the age of military yeah, service, yeah, whatever it is, it. if there's decent compliance, or at least it's no worse than the average of those who have made the legal commitment, you could live with that. Where it becomes, I think, much more problematic is when there's a, a real rejection of multilateralism and on um, the fundamental idea that the world will do better if collectively we try to improve everybody's position. And, and uh, so the, the kind of assertion of uh, uh, a totally self-interested political agenda, I think, is, is less uh, conducive to making multilateralism work. Yeah. And as I said, what's particularly uh, challenging is that all the big issues are quintessentially issues that require. You know, I was in Geneva recently, and they had an exhibit on the history of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that because, again, my back, I don't have an academic background in international affairs, but apparently, at least that's what I saw in these pictures, the very first um, true international cooperation in the modern era was to align uh, railroads. Really? So if you have rails in your countries, in France, for instance, but when it gets to Belgium, they're not the same size, not very conducive to trade and so on. So these were, it's a very good, to me, image yeah. of some things necessitate. It's in everybody's interest to have tracks that match, essentially. <laughs> Uh, and then you can transport. So commerce, obviously, was was a great. Um, now, when you look at where we are, I'm not sure that it's in the same mood of uh, international trade as a cooperative endeavor. Yeah. So what will it take? Um, not that we wish it, but they are sometimes events that reshuffle the deck and, yeah. and reshape the planet, whether they're natural disasters or massive conflicts and so on. Uh, one would hope that we would use other means, uh, at least to prevent, and if we cannot prevent, at least to address adequately these events. It it may come from some of the technological um, uh, developments, but there again, see if you look at the speed of development of artificial intelligence, for instance, it looks like we've learned nothing from the speed at which the internet and the whole digital economy took off before we had time to put in place a proper regulation. Right. Yeah. It's very hard to do when all the horses have left the stable. So now on AI, um, it's another environment that will have impact yes, right yes, across yes. borders. And you don't sense a huge appetite to Share get together, right yes, yeah. to manage. Um, um, well, on, on that issue of multilateralism and the lack of leadership, um, I wanted to bring our bring the subject now to the Global Compact on Migration. And just as a prelude to that, obviously we know that the US backed out of the negotiations. Um, how much of, what kind of impact did it have? Do you think that it was able to proceed to the conclusions that it did without the United States? Or was there a negative sense because the US wasn't a participant? I mean, I know it was negative to the United States. To abandon our role as a global leader on these issues was such a dereliction of duty. It was a moral fa failure, which I think we will suffer from for a very long time. But I just wonder what its impact on the convention, on the compact itself was. Well, the, the US formally announced it, that it would not participate in the consultations and negotiations at the, the meeting that preceded the launch of all these events in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, 
And the fear when this announcement was made, which lasted fortunately only about 15 minutes, was that all of Latin America would walk out. That if the US is not there, there was a whole continent that would feel that this exercise was pointless. And this would really have been the end. As I said, the initiative for the compact was very European. Mm -hmm. uh, but the minute we started talking about it, it was very clear that the big issues in human mobility were not the so-called crisis on the borders of Europe. It was, there was a whole range of issues yeah. that had to be addressed. So had the, the Latin American countries pulled out at that point, this would have been catastrophic. And in fact, it was exactly the opposite. It, it generated a lot of energy that uh, we need to talk about these issues. We need to put them in the public forum. Uh, you know, I said before, when you say things, you know, words carry and actions carry a weight. I think the absence of the, in the US, I have to say, when they say we're not participating, they weren't. There was no, not a lot of sense of any kind of backroom muscling around on issues during the negotiation phase. But when it got very close to the end, it's very clear that it emboldened uh, others who might not have gone completely alone in opposing this, frankly, <laughs> very mild yeah. document, yeah. a very cooperative framework, and not a very offensive document. Um, the only, frankly, the, other, the only other country that was vocally um, uh, antagonistic to the whole effort was Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, the so foreign minister that. would come to the meetings and he would say in no uncertain terms, immigration is a bad thing, it is stoppable, and it must be stopped. Which frankly, it was actually quite, there's no other words, it's so ridiculous as to be funny. I mean, for, to say to a country like Canada, immigration is a bad thing, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. I mean, we take in 1% of our population every year, without which, uh, and, and currently, there's a lot of tensions because uh, we have shortages of human resources yeah. in all sectors of the economy. So to just assert that immigration is a bad thing, um, when you purport to speak to the, to the world yeah. as a general proposition, yeah. that's what it is. It is what it is. Um, no, again, it is problematic because Canada, the United States, we are countries which are have been Im immigrating countries for as long as our history began, and we we in the United States have traditionally celebrated this fact that we're a nation of immigrants, and we're constantly talking about you know the number of startup countries in Silicon Valley, which were started by either immigrants or the children of immigrants, the number of Fortune 500 country, companies that are either run by immigrants or the children of immigrants. I mean, you've got everybody from um, Steve Jobs to Indra Nuri have you know, big, big CEOs in this country who've mobilized resources and created great companies and contributed to our, our economy. And they're immigrants or the children of immigrants. So it's hard for me to understand why Americans can look, overlook this disconnect and say immigration is bad, when we wouldn't be where we were our, as a country, as an economy, if we didn't have this constant stream of immigrants. Um, it's just very hard to understand. But you know, it, the compact itself, as you said, was hijacked by a couple of issues, Western-oriented issues, in which they drilled down in their own self-interest and took the energy and the work away from some of the broader, more cooperative issues. That was sort of a, a tragedy, not a, a, more, a minor tragedy, but a tragedy. And um, the other thing that troubled me so much, and you referred to it, is the fact that from the very inception, the compact was mischaracterized and demonized okay. by a set of actors on a global stage who had never read it, never even understood it, what it was about, but assumed and, ad, and, and publicized the notion that the UN was advocating procedures to increase refugee, immigrant flows. Yeah. And it was, you know, once that is in the mindset of the public, then there becomes a backing off and an unwillingness to look, let alone support the compact. So, you know, it, it, it was a victim of many of the cross, ugly cross currents in our society today. But you see, in a sense, it's not a victim. It's there. It yeah. was adopted. It's yeah. a non-legally binding document. Yeah. But I think for years to come, it will remain 
the reference on whether it's on reducing the cost of transfer mm -hmm. of remittances. Um, there's a whole range of issues. It ranges from improving the, it's pretty self-obvious, but the, the plight of people in developing countries so that they I are not forced so to leave. Forced to leave yeah. Is anybody seriously against that idea? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's the Sustainable Development Goals. It's the whole program of the United right. Nations. So increasing development opportunities so that forced displacement, aside from persecution, decreases yeah. rather than increases. So it has all kinds of ideas. It's there. It's a, in my opinion, a very good document. I didn't write it. It was... I always say I midwife the document, <laughs> but it, the pen holders yeah. were the ambassadors of Mexico and, and uh, Switzerland yeah. um, to the UN last year. They produced a very good text. It was negotiated. It was so. It's not perfect. No. Uh, and some NGOs would have written some provisions a bit differently, but everybody made a few concessions. And again, it's a lot of it is very aspirational. But it's very helpful. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I recommend reading it because it is a very, I think, inspiring document because it really does touch on all the issues that face not only those countries which are, not only the migrants, immigrants themselves or the migrants themselves, but the countries who are dealing with the outflows of their population and the problems within those countries that causes outflow. It also deals with the problem that transit countries face in dealing with this flow of people in their borders, how to handle them, how to respect their human rights, how to assist them while they assist them while they are in transit. And also, of course, they're receiving countries. And most Western countries, whether they're willing to admit it or not, do need more immigrants. I mean, Germany is one of the few countries which says up front, we need immigrants. And they're still taking in about 200,000 refugees a year. And I don't know what their immigrant number is, but I know that they are still taking in a lot of people. We in the United States will always need immigrants because there's so many jobs that need to be done that Americans won't do. Plus, we will need skilled immigrants in areas of our population, various our, of our economy and social policy, which are starved. We, 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 are, we need more doctors in the United States of America. I don't like the idea of us taking doctors from poorer countries in the world when those doc doctors should be serving the countries from which they come from. But the fact of the matter is there are prof professions in which we don't have enough supply ourselves in our own society, and we need immigrants to, to form that. So, you know, if the countries. Most people who read the document with a, a, an open mind will find so much about it which is just makes such common sense, if nothing else, that it's hard to understand how it could have been so demonized by um, those who are opposed to the very notion of any discussion of these issues. So um, we, hopefully it will, it will stand the test of time and be referred to, as you say, over and over again. Um, you know, it's been one year since the compact came into operation. So um, what do you see as the early signs of success? Well, I have to say... It's I'm, early. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, basically one of the things that the compact did. It has a, a monitoring, you know, it's, mm. it's a living document. And it also brought to some extent, IOM, the International Organization of Migration, closer into the UN system. And we, the Secretary General agreed, and that's why my function was finished. I midwifed the compact. And then there's a, um, a UN sort of migration network mm -hmm. that is based in IOM, so all the agencies. Uh, because before that, I think it suited member states who didn't want to talk about that issue. Migration didn't have a home in the UN system. Mm -hmm. IOM was the big organization, outside. but it was completely yeah. outside. And UNHCR, of course, its mandate was refugees expended, of course, to internal, interna, internal displacement. But the rest of it was uh, everybody had little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, inside at least, there's more coordination. There will be periodic assessment of issues in progress. So I think it's moving slowly. Slowly. <laughs> Less slowly. Um, so at that point, I could talk to Louise forever, but I would love to turn it over to um, questions from the audience. And I think we have a mic in the back, if you want to go to the back and ask a question. Would you, you know, are you bringing the mic? I have oh, good. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Abigail Woodward. Um, I hear that the U.S. is just not paying its dues at the U.N. Uh, are we like six years in arrears? Honestly, I don't know. I think... Uh, 
there are several countries have histories of delinquency. I think the U.S. has had a history. I know that the Secretary General is always very pressed for... Um, I think the U.S. renegotiated some years ago its assessment. It pays, obviously, a very large portion of a, through a formula that applies to everybody. But honestly, as we stand today, I don't know if the U.S. is in arrears or if it's all paid up. Thank you. Microphone, yeah, right there, this gentleman on the aisle. Thanks. My name is Sam David Offcore. I'm a second year international law and organizations uh, student here focusing on migration and, and uh, refugee policy. So much of, you know, the refugee regime, you know, and, and refugee law and really international law in general is very backwards looking, you know, trying to solve the problems of yesterday or today. So in the discussions, in the negotiations around the global compact, you know, how much attention was paid to kind of future-proofing it, to trying to anticipate the problems of tomorrow, specifically uh, with how technology is going to impact migration, and, you know, depending on how much discussion there was, what are some of the key things that are missing in that regard? Uh, well, I think you're entirely correct. It's the same thing in security and a lot of issues. We're always fighting yesterday's war, and, and on this particular issue, in the whole two years uh, discussions on international migration, I'm afraid we were still very much looking backwards. For instance, there was very little appetite to talk about climate migrants. Uh, and I, probably rightly so in not putting another label that would become very difficult to define. Uh, but there was you know, not a lot of interest in trying to anticipate where the large movements of populations will come in the future. Uh, not a lot of interest in talking about the informal economies in Western countries, but all over the world, which um, house actually irregular migrants and the likely increase of that if we don't um, sort of open borders in a more uh, uh, managed way. So I have to say, despite the fact that academics and, you know, there, there are communities that are very aware of the challenges we're going to face, but it's, it was very difficult to get, uh, you know, as I said, to me it was very clear that what would have been helpful is to enlarge mm -hmm. the obligation to deal with, with persons who essentially don't have a country, so an, ex an expansion of the refugee convention, this was uh, of no interest. And I think climate, and the, the problem with climate change is that the, the little bit of evidence we have so far is that in the case of the, the sudden um, onset of a natural disaster, there's usually a pretty adequate response. Uh, if there's an earthquake or a landslide or a, a tsunami or a flood, the neighborhood, the, the, the international community rallies pretty quickly and at least in the short term there's adequate response. Where it's very invidious is in the slow onset, desertification, you know, at what point can you say this habitat is no longer suitable for humans? Um, and when would we view that as forced displacement as opposed to, well, you could tough it out another generation? So, and even in a theoretical model, as much as I said maybe we should have expanded the Refugee Convention, I became persuaded that the idea of forced displacement is not the key to the future. It's not going to be a helpful way. I think to look at it, and that's a very good example of how invidious it could be to, to, to try to determine some kind of legal entitlements on the basis of a, a mix of what objective, subjective perceptions by people involved. So the small islands, the Pacific Islands, were very engaged in the migration um, uh, compact negotiations. And in a sense, I think, um, like for them, there's the reality that their territory will disappear. But for m millions of others, the conditions of their... And in Canada, for instance, we can think of people of the north. You know, what kind of impact climate change will have. The likelihood is that they will, their mobility will be fully accommodated within our country. But it's not the same, I think, in lots of other parts of the world. Hi, my name is Sarah Sadik. I'm a program manager for African-based organization. And my question 
goes to when you, like you said, you midwife the covenant, co uh, uh, the covenant on migration. I'm th and thank you for pointing out that when we think migrant, we don't think European white migrant. Unfortunately, we often think about, like you said, Latin American migrant, or like from the Middle East or from sub African country. And I'm and I would be curious to know when you you attended those conversation between the country, different country. For example, what was um, the French position about the 300,000 French that lived in UK, that now it's Brexit, what's gonna happen to all those poor migrants, for example? How are they gonna say, they're all just gonna come back to Paris, like what's gonna happen? And also, my second question would be, what was the conversation about the country that di directly neighbor um, where there are conflicts and who are actually welcoming most of the uh, refugees, for example, either it's Uganda com uh, compared to RDC, uh, for example, like uh, I will give also like Lebanon and Jordan uh, about Syrian people. So I would be curious to know like what was the position of the developing country, most of them, uh, about the migration conversation. Thank you. Well, again, if we use the definition that I mentioned before, that is a migrant is a person who has lived for more than one year in a country other than his country of origin of nationality, the continent that does, has the highest intensity of migrants is Europe. <laughs> of migrants, and people live, and in large part because of the European Union. Uh, and Africa actually is moving very much in that direction. as. Uh, the perception is that, you know, the whole of Africa wants to move to Denmark. I don't think so. Uh, and in fact, most people who move, move first within their own country. And if that fails or there's no, not enough opportunities there, they move in their immediate neighborhood. We know all that. It's the same all over the world and then further, uh, further away. And the African Union, of course, has been talking, the recent Kigali Protocol is all based on a, a kind of model of collapsing borders within the continent for trade. It starts usually with the mobility of capital, mobility of goods, and then ultimately mobility of people. So a lot of that is happening in Africa. Now, Africa will grow by 45% in the next 30 years. The demographics, are, we talk about climate change, demographics are another, is another factor. Europe will shrink by 9%. Well, Africa will grow by 45, and not to mention Japan, Russia, countries that are in very, very severe demographic decline. And uh, when that's the case, and these projections are some of the more reliable. If you look at the work from the UN Population Division, because it's basically um, fertility and mortality rates, and they're very hard to change. So what we know is worldwide, at least in the developed world, uh, fertility is declining, and um, life expectancy keeps increasing. If we carry on living for 200 years, uh, but this is not a very useful workforce. I, I can attest personally to that. <laughs> so essentially, so we know that the, the sustainability of economic development in most um, developed countries is gonna be based on migration, which is why it is so short-sighted yeah. by leaders to poison the idea of foreigners coming into a country when in fact, and we're not talking long, long term, 22nd century, we're talking in the coming decades, um, it's gonna be critical uh, for the well-being of these countries. So, and the, the other part of your question very much was addressing more the refugee aspects. And you see, because the so-called crisis in Europe was first, a refugee issue was mostly people coming from Syria, with some from Pakistan, Afghanistan coming along. But then it morphed into the wave coming after the collapse of Libya and all these sort of African. This was a much more mixed population of refugees, mostly Eritrea, Somalia, uh, South Sudan. But then uh, of what some people would call economic migrants. You just have to look at these boats. Ask yourself, seriously, th th that you're calling that economic migrants, this is not like people who come in with $500,000 to start a business and you know have opportunities to settle um, just about anywhere in the world. So um, this, these were very mixed populations. And uh, the question of who takes in refugees, um, again, uh, people tend to forget that the, and I don't like to use the expression, the burden sharing is, has been very unequal. There's no question that in 
the Syrian context, it's Lebanon, Jordan, um, Turkey, um, that have taken in a lot of people. In the case of Myanmar, Bangladesh is mm. sitting there. And then, again, you see some of the distortions. Canada launched an excellent program of uh, sponsorship of refugees. Mm -hmm. The reason it was, in my opinion, it was very successful is that for each Syrian family that was sponsored in Canada, you had 30, 40, 50 people embracing them. You had to raise, it was either a, a church group, a street, a community, anybody could get together. You needed to raise $30,000 to support them for a year. It was immensely popular. It was a feel-good exercise. It was good for the family that were supported when they arrived. It was good for the communities. But in the end, we took in 25, 30, maybe 40,000 people on that basis. It's not yeah. that much, but it's good, but it's not a lot of people. It's not, it's not a lot of, well, look at, we're legally taking in 10,000 refugees this year. Oh, well, and then, it, you know, this administration wants to go to zero. But you know, just on that point, the Canadian Embassy had a filming of a little documentary here at SICE, which myself and another SICE professor spoke at. And it was a beautiful, beautiful film about a town in Canada which had come together and agreed to adopt a family. And they'd gotten a little house. They'd you know, decorated it, supplied it, had this little nursery with sort of drawings and pictures and for babies and things like that. And they were so excited. And there was about two dozen families which had signed up to support this refugee family. And they had to wait about a year for the family mm -hmm. actually to arrive. But the conversations in the community of about taking in this refugee and what they were going to do and how they were going to do it and who was going to do this and who was going to do that was one of the most heartwarming things I have seen in a very, very long time. And what I think was interesting about it is the numbers may have been small, but the model and sort of the yes, waves of good. goodwill that the program created, not only for the communities that did that, but for others who heard about it. And that gets me back to one issue, which I might maybe close on unless there's another question. You know, is this issue of, we talk about it always in the refugee community, changing the narrative about immigrants. I mean, you know, you said, you said that there are several hundred million migrants in the world today. I read somewhere that they, you might know that these figures are correct or not, that the total number of, of migrants in the world amounts to 3.5% of the global population but they together produce 10% of global GNP. So you've got this tiny little group of people who are productive at a higher rate, at a bigger level, at a more impactful level than many of their compatriots in other countries. And so this, I mean, it's a big effort. We've encountered bigger challenges in this world, but really, really changing the narrative about who migrants and immigrants are and what they contribute to the societies that they land in and what they contribute back home in remittances. Those numbers on remittances are not well known in the public. Three times the amount of official development aid that Western countries surprise, three times that amount is, is is created in remittances which go back to developing countries. And it's just a huge and constructive contribution to global growth and to the health and well-being of a lot of poor countries. If I could just maybe talk about perceptions and the narratives, it may not be very well known in this country that like you, but in a very different way, we have a southern border. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You have a northern border, you don't talk about it very often, but and the reason, the reason I raise it is because it's very interesting. First of all, it's not all Canadians who adore migration and migrants and foreigners and think the whole world should move in, but not the case like everywhere else. Lots of prejudice and, you know, it's these... And even in the school community, there were some sort of naysayers. Oh yeah, yeah. there's yeah. some, there's skeptics and so on. But the reason I mention our southern border is that and this is a very good example of how a national immigration policy can have 
I won't call it unintended consequences because I don't care about intention. The question is whether consequences are foreseeable, whether you have foreseeable consequences. So when the United States announced in, I think, 2018 that the government was going to uh, put an end to the temporary protection a program for 200,000 Salvadorians. Announcements like that immediately, um, not immediately, but when there is a perception, and first of all, in the case of El Salvador, I think uh, remittances are about that 20% of GDP. Really? You can imagine what it would do to a country yeah. with high unemployment if 200,000 people come back home, dry up the 20% of your GDP in remittances and have 200,000 unemployed. Anyway, that's another story. But So you may think about these kinds of issues, but you wouldn't think it would have anything to do with Canada. Well, actually, it does. Because historically, very much, well, in our case, nobody rose in in a rowboat from the Arctic or the Pacific or the Atlantic. So we only have one land border. And contrary to Europeans, we don't have refugees who come in. And so we have the luxury of very good resettlement uh, policies. So these families who sponsor um, refugees, these refugees are in UNHCR camp. They've been vetted for yeah, yeah. any kind of criminal background. and So, so it's kind of the ideal model. Mm -hmm. But we had a little bit of a shock when in the last two years, this was unprecedented, I think, since draft dodgers from the Vietnam War, that people crashed our border. So it's called Roxham. You could Google it. It's in Quebec. There's this passage where people come from the United States. Why do they come this way? To make refugee claims. Because we have a safe third country agreement with the US. So if these people came to a, a, an official border crossing point and say, I want to make a refugee claim, we have to send them back. We, we, cannot, we don't even determine their uh -huh. claim. So the only way they can make a refugee claim in Canada because of the safe country agreement is to cross at, it's, it's at an irregular border crossing between, so basically in a field somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's a large border. Right? There'd be lots of places, lots of places. If you skip the Great Lakes, because that's a bit challenging, but lots of other places. But anyway, they all come through Roxham, and the RCMP are waiting there. And you'll see it. There's lots of, you could go on YouTube, you'll see all these, this footage. So there's people with suitcases, families, suitcases, all there's sometimes in the snow. They're approaching. They, take, they, they go to Plattsburgh. They take a taxi to the point. The RCMP is on the other side, and they say, this is Canada. If you cross this thing, you will be entering Canada illegally, you'll have to be arrested. Do you understand? The person says, yes, I understand. They cross, they're arrested, they make a refugee claim. In the last two years, 50,000. Really? Uh, it's a lot of strain in our refugee determination process. Uh, and it leads to a change in the public's yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. Um, some members of the public uh, call for the, the repeal of the safe third country agreement. There's all kinds of debate. But all of a sudden, you, you see something in yeah. the Canadian press that we never saw before, which is, well, what are these illegal immigrants crashing borders? See? This is not part of the history of immigration yeah, in yeah. Canada. It's a byproduct. Of, of our of US policy, right? Well. Yeah. 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 In part. Yes. Well, well <laughs> yes. yes, we're all suffering. Um, well, Louise, thank you very much. That was very, very um, wide, wide ranging, and very, very interesting. And we also, we personally, I personally, I think everybody else here wants to thank you for your great contributions to important issues as a senior UN official in a range of different posts which you have served well. Oh, you didn't mention the International Crisis Group. But anyway, she, well, Louise has had a wonderful career, and she, it continues to be a wonderful career. And I think all of you have benefited from hearing from her. And so a great round of applause for Louise.